this little sample here, which is just a plastic tube filled with water here on the left and filled with powder sugar here on the right. You see the corresponding phase contrast image goes nothing here. So this is just completely undefined because the intensity uh, oscillation height uh, is zero. It's is completed because the beam has been diffused. Uh, well, this tube is still nicely visible. But of course, you can turn it around and say, now we are taking this loss of interference capability, so the coherence of the extra beam, so to speak, to form an image. And that's the one up here. So this highlights very much because it now scatters the beam very much. And if you look at microscopy or electron microscopy, this is then called a dark field image because you are actually looking at scattering structures in the beam on a dark background. That's why we also call it an X-ray dark field image. And um, that's actually quite interesting. Um, for example, for those samples, these are pretty boring-like substances in attenuation. Uh, actually, uh, it turns out that this is uh, homogeneous young gouda. Uh, and these are two uh, polycrystalline uh, plastic explosives. Uh, those two things are um, highly polycrystalline, so have lots of density variations on the micron scale. Scatter, diffuse the beam a lot. Homogeneous cheese uh, is very boring on the micron scale, uh, maybe also in the mouth. Um, uh, if, if it was with, with grana, uh, it's of course uh, really quite different. Um, so, so this shows you that there's additional value to gain and you can actually um, bring this uh, a little further uh, and uh, add, uh, in this way, colors to X-ray images, like here. And what we do there is a little bit involved. What we do there is actually we rotate the sample around an axis which uh, coincides with the axis of the setup. So if we take this little leaf here, the strawberry leaf, uh, you see that this dark field image, as we rotate it around, it changes its gray scale. So it's here very bright, it's also very bright here, but it's not so bright here. And that has to do with the fact that if these scattering structures are uh, parallel to the grading structures, we get a very strong extinction of this interference contrast, and if they are perpendicular, we get almost no change of this visibility contrast. So we can assign this orientational scattering to a tensor, essentially, and, and add a color to it. So in this one, you see the uh, brightness mapped as the scattering power of X-ray, and the color then reflects the direction of the scattering. You see here, uh, blue means that these uh, scattering structures are scattering in this perpendicular direction. Of course, this rotates around to this green part. So we can, for a given pixel in the image, in the X-ray image, not only say that something is scattering, but we can also say in which direction it is pre predominantly scattering. Now we come to something that might be of interest to you also, um, uh, osteoporosis bones. Obviously a hot topic. Uh, right now osteoporosis is mainly characterized by a general loss of mass density in the bone. But uh, it's well known that this does not account for, for most of, for many of the, of the uh, fractures that we actually observe in the clinics. Uh, osteoporosis is also associated with a change of the microstructure in the bone. So you actually remove more the perpendicular structure if the node only comes from top all the time and so on. So if you take, uh, for example, a, a human trochlear bone, do a slice and, and image it with a normal high resolution X-ray uh, imager, you see, of course, all these microstructures here in this case align radially from the inner part to the outer part. <coughs> that's no big magic. If you have high resolution, you see them anyway on the micron scale, so that's not the problem. And also, if we add colors, uh, it just reproduces what we see anyway. So we see here these blue structures pointing this direction, the green structures pointing this direction. Now, the interesting part comes now. If we actually uh, start rebinning these pictures or even redoing this on very, very coarse resolution, clinically compatible resolution of 500 micron or so, we, of course, lose the individual uh, depiction of these little trabeculae, but the color remains, so we can still see the average orientation of these little trabecular bones, but we would have no way whatsoever to see this orientation in a normal classical extra radiograph, which is up here. So we can see this direction of orientation due to uh, X-ray wave scattering interactions, in spite of the fact that our uh, pixel size is actually um, 
quite large and clinically compatible. So with this, I'm at the acknowledgement and I have 10 seconds of time I'm from Tokyo, Japan. It's kind of right. yes, thank you very much. A nice presentation. I'm very surprised. Uh, I have uh, some question now. Uh, how long do you take uh, this uh, phase contrast image in a, uh, in a mass? How long? How long do you take? How long? How long? Time. 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 How long it takes to do the images? Yeah. Yeah. There's no one answer for all of the examples that I've been showing, of course. But if we Talking about our small animal scanner, the goal is to do a full CT in 20 minutes as, as compatible with anesthesia of small animals. So right now, uh, this one projection, for example, of the mouse that I've been showing, that was uh, 4 times 10 seconds or something like this. Okay, there is a question. Yes, Ulrich Malmann from Regensburg. Thank you very much for this brilliant presentation and congratulations. My question refers to how important is it to have a monochromatic radiation? Um, so, we, if we have a 